Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. It has been a while, but I'm back with something historical and sparkly to share, specifically an 1830s design made from very vibrant green plaid silk shanting. Since that wasn't eye-catching enough for me, I decided to decorate it with several yards of handmade puff trim, which is outlined with tiny gold sequins and decorated with artificial pearls. This project was inspired by this fashion plate that I found while browsing Pinterest, as you do, along with my desire to use this fabric, which has been sitting in my stash for a couple of years now. I'm not a big fan of the oppressive heat and bugs and humidity that summer brings with it, but I do enjoy the greenery outside my window, and this was a way to bring some of that greenery into my sewing room, while avoiding the heat and bugs and humidity. Today I'll be focusing on the bodice, and I started this project by draping the bodice shapes I wanted on my dress form, then creating a mock-up. Some major alterations were required, which you can see on the left side, but I did end up with a pattern I felt confident using, and I used it to first cut out the flat lining layer for the bodice. This is made from medium weight cotton muslin and will add some heft to the much thinner silk. As you saw in the intro, I'll be embellishing this and adding trim, which requires handling the fabric a lot, and this will prevent it from warping during that process. When the flat lining was cut, I laid the front and back pieces atop the pattern and traced both the dart and trim placement onto the material. The cotton is thin enough that I could easily see the markings on the pattern through the fabric, which made them easy to transfer. I used the same pattern to cut the bodice out from silk. Each piece of silk was matched to its cotton counterpart, and I basted them together by hand. I kept the basting stitches within the seam allowances, or the outer half inch of each piece, so they wouldn't be visible after everything was sewn together. The only exception are the basting stitches I sewed atop the trim markings on the lining. These transfer the desired trim placement onto the outside of the fabric, which is helpful since that is where the trim will actually be positioned. I just didn't want to permanently mark the silk layer of material. Now I'm sewing the darts into the front panels. The darts are placed at the shoulder and waistline to offer shaping, and I marked where these should be sewn onto the fabric, so I'm just following those lines with my needle. While I was at the sewing machine, I also stitched up the center back seam, which was carefully pinned so all of the stripes would be aligned and continuous across the seam, but I didn't film that part. Now I'm seaming together the lining lining. I cut the pattern from cotton twice, once for the flat lining layer, and another for an independent lining that will cover all the raw edges on the interior much later on. It is assembled in the same manner, just without the basting business. So the darts and back seam were sewn up. And then I decided to sew some twill tape channels over the lower dart, at the sides, and at the center back and center front. These will eventually be filled with boning and help support the garment and prevent it from collapsing or riding up when it's worn. The shoulder seams for both the silk and lining layers were pinned and sewn as well. I also stitched up the side back seams for the lining, then set it aside. I did not do this for the silk layer, at least not yet, since it prevents the bodice from being laid flat and will make attaching the trim harder. And that is actually the next step, or it would be. I had to make the trim first. One of the things that drew me to this fashion plate was the trim. Some 1830s dresses are wild in how extravagantly they are trimmed, and don't get me wrong, I love them. That is part of what makes the period amazing, but it doesn't always translate well in reality, and it can be intimidating to even attempt. But some coordinating puff trim? I can do that. And you probably can too, because I shall show you how. The first step was just cutting six inch wide or so strips of fabric. I'm using the vertical stripes on the fabric as a guide for this, opposed to markings made with a ruler. I'll actually be using the markings on the fabric a lot for this, they came in handy. And I'm cutting out quite a few strips here as I'll be making enough trim for the skirt and bonnet as well. After the strips are cut, I press the edges inward by about a half inch. From the backside of the fabric, I'm making marks near the folded edges that are one and a half inches apart. I'm making these marks on both edges, but I'm staggering them by three quarters of an inch. So one of the marks starts an inch and a quarter away from the end of the strip, and the other starts two inches away from the end. Here's a piece of the marked material with the marks highlighted in case there's any confusion. And these points mark where I'll be gathering the fabric. I'll actually be gathering the strip horizontally at that point from the folded edge to just past the center. And this will be repeated for the markings on each side. Here are the gathering points highlighted, again, to hopefully clear up any confusion. And this is where the striped nature of this fabric comes in handy. I didn't have to mark these points horizontally. I could just sew parallel or cross whatever stripe was closest to the marking. And speaking of sewing, I'm starting a half inch beyond the center point on the back side of the fabric. Then I'm stitching outward from that point to the folded edge using running stitches. I pulled the thread tightly to gather the material at that point. Then I push the needle back through the point I started at and wrap the thread around the gathered point to help hold it in place. The thread is knotted once again near the point I started at. 
Then I jump an inch and a half upward, so I'm parallel to the next marking, still a half inch beyond the center point. The thread is knotted once, then the process is repeated. The fabric is gathered at that point, then the thread is wrapped around the gathers and tied once. I found it was fastest to follow the markings and gather one side down completely, as opposed to jumping back and forth to either side. I'm including a lot of footage of this step and you'll see it again in the later video on this project, but here are some photos showing the progression of the trim. This is the marked strip, one side gathered from the right side, both sides gathered from the right side, and both sides gathered from the wrong side. I realize at this point the trim doesn't look like much, it really comes to life when it is ironed. And it is ironed in a very particular way. I'm using the weight of my iron to briefly hold down one end. Then I'm using my fingers to pull the sides of the trim outward, making each gathered section shorter but wider, resembling more of a puff. Then the iron is moved forward to cover the puff segment and press it in place. This is repeated over and over until you either run out of trim or burn your fingers so many times that you need a break. Once the trim is done, it should be much wider and have more character. I don't know. I think it looks much nicer and has more defined scallops at each edge. I pinned the freshly pressed trim over the basting stitched points on the bodice, then the edges could be stitched down by hand, permanently securing it in place. But was that enough for me? No. I like the subtlety of the matching trim, but it was a little too subtle. So to make its presence more visible, I decided to outline it with sequins. I used a mixture of flat 2mm and cupped 3mm gold sequins, stitched on in a random pattern along the edges of the trim. I didn't do anything super dense or specific, I just wanted to add a bit more interest. And I chose gold because the fabric has metallic threads in the pattern and because the final garment will have gold buttons. Shockingly, this was also not enough to please the goblin inside of me that demands more when it comes to embellishments, so I ended up adding off-white pearls to the bottom of each puff in the trim. Not just one pearl, one 6mm pearl, one 3mm pearl, and one 1mm glass beads since they did not have any pearls that tiny. These create a nice little stack that adds more texture, highlights the white and the stripes of the fabric, and only vaguely resembles a grub sitting on a leaf. If it more than vaguely resembles that, perhaps it is fitting as this dress was inspired by summer and bugs are an annoyingly prevalent part of this season. With the embellishment finally done, for now, I could sew up the side back seams. You can see me pinning and stitching them in this footage. I left about two inches of extra allowance at the front edge in case this ended up being too small or having some elaborate closure method, but I didn't end up needing it. So here I'm marking what can be cut off, then using that mark as a guide for the placket, which was pinned along that point. Off camera, I sewed the placket on, following the vertical line of the stripe on the placket piece, which is just a rectangular scrap I had left over from making trim. I cut off the excess, then pinned the placket so the long edges were tucked inward, the top edge was level, and the right sides were facing each other. While in this orientation, I stitched a half inch away from the top edge of just the placket, so this was like a one inch long seam. Then I clipped excess volume from the corner of the placket and turned it right side out, so the raw edges were tucked inward. I realize I did not do a good job of explaining or filming this, and for that I apologize, I was eager to move on after like three days of making trim and sewing on beads. Here's what the placket looks like when fully pinned on. I ended up replacing those pins with basting stitches off camera. The other side was not trimmed, but was instead turned inward by several inches, and once again, I filmed pinning it, but not sewing it. Now I decided the dress needed a collar. Did I make a normal standing collar from starched cotton? Of course not. Don't be absurd, that would be way too easy. No, I pulled these lace collars from my stash and made a cardboard template matching their dimensions with an extra half inch at the top edge. I traced around this template onto layers of silk and cotton. Then I cut a half inch or so away from the outline, leaving enough excess to serve as seam allowances. I cut eight pieces of silk and eight pieces of cotton using this template. I'll be using four collars for the collar collar and two for each cuff, so I needed eight in total. I think these collars were made for children's clothing because they are pretty tiny, but they will end up working for what I have in mind. 
All my pieces were taken over to the ironing board. The top edges were aligned with the top of the template, then the outer edges were wrapped over the template and pressed in place. This is way more precise than turning the edges inward by eye, and faster since the curves can be tricky to press smoothly. I repeated this for both the cotton and the silk pieces. The lace collars were pinned atop the silk so the outer edges were even. Then by hand I basted all the edges of the lace collar onto the silk, making them opaque enough for what I had envisioned. But they were not sparkly enough for what I envisioned, though to be fair, few things in life are. I decided these would also be outlined with gold sequins, so a row of 2mm sequins was stitched on. I repeated this on a few collars before deciding they looked incomplete. Then I decided to add larger, iridescent sequins to the floral motifs within the lace, and I alternated the direction of the sequins, so some face in and some face out to offer variation to the flowers. Here's a fully sequined collar, and I feel like I could have embellished these a lot more, so I was pretty restrained, but I wasn't completely finished yet either. The collars will also have puff trim around the edges. This was created using a narrower strip than the trim on the bodice, though the process of making it was very similar. One edge was pressed inward, then I marked points an inch and a half apart, about a half inch away from the top edge. It was gathered down using the same method shown earlier, but since I only needed one edge to be visible, there is only one side that is folded inward and gathered. But still, the whole running stitches, wrapping the thread, knotting it off, moving to the next marking, knotting it off again, and repeating was the same. It was also pressed in the same manner, with the edges being pulled to open it up, then promptly pressing it so it would help that shape. The trim was then pinned onto the outer edges of the collars. The raw edges are tucked underneath, with the scalloped slash puffed edge exposed. I sewed it on all the way across the perimeter of the collar, then using heavier duty thread I went back through and pulled the gathered points to be a bit tighter, and sit flush against the edge of the collar. The thread was knotted once, then a gold bead was sewn over the gathers. The thread was knotted again, then I moved to the next gathering point and repeated the process. Now the right side of the collars looked pretty great. The inside, however, not so much. That is where the cotton pieces I cut and pressed earlier come in. I pinned these to the back side of each embellished collar, then stitched the edges together from the back side using width stitches which aren't visible from the front. To fit the neckline of the bodice, the collars had to be overlapped somewhat, but I actually like the way it looks. It's almost like flower petals. Once it was pinned to my satisfaction, it was basted to the bodice with a half inch allowance. The seam allowance ended up being pretty thick, so off camera I had a heck of a time notching it, understitching it, and pressing it to get it to fold out smoothly. But once I accomplished that, it was time to resolve the interior of the bodice, which looked like this. And that is where our lining comes in. I put the bodice on the dress form inside out, then pinned the lining I made earlier atop it, so the raw edges and seams were aligned. The front edges and neckline edge of the lining were clipped and folded inward, then pinned to the bodice. This is how it looked after it was sewn in, but you can see how nicely it sits on the dress form, and how much easier it is to get in place using this method. And speaking of sewing it in place, that is what I'm doing here. I just basted it in place around the bottom edge, front, and arm side. Those points will all be further secured later on with either seams or closures. However, the neckline I used very small whip stitches to make sure it was perfectly level with the lace portion of the collar, so none of the silk lining or seam allowances would be visible. And I think I was pretty successful. The thing I did was add boning, and I had sort of forgotten that I added these channels to the lining, but I did, so I used them. I put a steel bone at the center front and sides, since that is where it needs the most support, but I used plastic boning at the back and under bust. There isn't enough boning in this to make this garment supportive in the way a bra or corset is. There's just enough boning to support the fabric and prevent it from creasing when the garment is worn. I'm not sure how common this was in the 1830s, but in the 1850s and onward throughout history it was very common, and still is in formal garments like wedding dresses today. With that done, this video is pretty much done. I can't fully finish the bodice until other elements like the sleeves and the skirt are done, but those will have to wait for another day and another video. In the meantime, I think we can both appreciate the bodice in its current state. I think it is pretty lovely. I love the fabric and I love how the trim and embellishments highlight it further. I hope you guys love it too and thanks so much for watching. If you're interested in seeing me make the sleeves and the skirt, then subscribe and stay tuned because I've already made both of those things and videos about them should soon follow. And if you'd like to see me make a matching bonnet, that video is available for $6 and up patrons over on the Patreon. And speaking of the Patreon, I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of my patrons. There will be a whole bunch of their names on screen, but I want to give a special shout out to my top tier patrons who are Jamie Denon, Remy S, Mary Kinsey, Wendy Nickerson, Vita Tormina, Cass, Heidi Neiser, and Jordan Carpenter. These are the credits for June, by the way, I'm working backwards. Thank you so much for your support over there if you are one of them, and thank you for your support over here just for being a viewer. I really do appreciate it, and I will talk to all of you very soon.